This is the new 2019 Aston Martin Vantage. It replaces the old Vantage, which I loved, which I owned after that car was on sale for 13 years. This is now the latest and greatest Aston Martin, and today I'm going to show you around it. I borrowed the new Vantage from Aston Martin of Newport Beach, which is here in beautiful Newport Beach, California, and which is full of some of the most beautiful cars on the road today. Now, the new Vantage just came out here in the United States, and it's already on sale here at Aston Martin of Newport Beach. And that's a big deal because the old one had been around forever, since 2006. Over the years, Aston Martin updated it, and they facelifted it, and they painted it with weird colors, and they put a V12 in it, and blah, 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 but now they've finally replaced it. This is the replacement, and it's striking. The 2019 Vantage uses a 503 horsepower twin-turbo V8, borrowed from Mercedes AMG. It's the same engine in all of the new AMG 63 cars and the same engine from the Mercedes AMG GT. Now, the Vantage starts around $150,000, making it the entry-level Aston Martin, although this one is equipped to around $185,000 with options. Right now, it's only offered with an 8-speed automatic, although a manual is reportedly on the way. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the new Vantage, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of Aston Martin's latest thrilling sports car. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Vantage, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of my five all-time favorite Aston Martin models. Now, I'm going to start the quirks and features with maybe this car's most unusual quirk, and that would be the hood release. In virtually every other car, the hood release is a little latch you pull in the driver's footwell. In this car, the hood release is a little latch you pull in the passenger footwell. That's because Aston Martin is British, and Britain, they drive on the right, and so the hood release goes in the right side footwell for the British market. And when they converted this car to left-hand drive for all the left-hand drive markets, they didn't bother to move the hood release over. Now, once you get under the hood, you will find your Mercedes AMG twin turbo V8 from the AMG GTS, over 500 horsepower under here. You will also find some interesting reminders of where the engine is from. Yes, Aston Martin has its usual plaque on the engine saying who gave it its final inspection in the Aston Martin factory. But if you look closely on a couple of these little tags, you'll see the AMG logo. Here's one, and here is another. You have to look closely. There's not just a giant AMG bag badge on the engine, but it doesn't take much to figure out that this is an AMG engine. Now, next up, I want to move on to the turn signals, which, of course, are in the housing for the headlights. The turn signals are very cool. When the car is just on and running, the turn signal lighting is LED lights light up in this bright white. But the moment you turn the turn signal on, the bright white goes away, and it becomes the turn signal. Now, that's kind of cool, but if you look closely, it's even cooler. Look at this. It's like this jagged light pattern that just sits there waiting until it's in use. I really like the look of this, and apparently it's supposed to simulate the wings on the Aston Martin logo. Now, next up, we move on to the grille, which has been a big point of controversy for this car, largely due to its size and the fact that there's no crossbars or anything to break it up. It's just sort of there, and a lot of people don't really like that. Now, personally, I like it, or I'm kind of indifferent about it. I don't think it really changes the fact that the rest of the car looks so striking. Now, apparently, it's supposed to evoke the crazy expensive Aston Martin Vulcan race car, because the Vantage is the sportier Aston Martin, whereas the DB11 gets sort of a smaller, classier grille because it's more of the luxury car. But regardless, here's how it looks, and you can form your own opinion about it. Around back, the lighting is also very cool. You can see there's this light bar that goes the full way across the back, but it sort of curves upward in the middle to allow room for the Aston Martin Wings logo and the Aston Martin script on the rear. Now, when you turn on the car, the taillights look very cool, and it also looks cool when you turn on the turn signals or when you put on the brake lights. But regardless of which lighting you have on back here, it is a very distinctive look in the back of this car, and I think it looks pretty cool. 
Now, when you open up the tailgate, you'll see there is a reasonable amount of cargo room back here, and there's some interesting quirks in the cargo area, one of which is this cargo divider. Now, this divider has leather on the top with stitching, just like the rest of the interior, but the interesting thing about it is that when you put it up, it works in tandem with the cargo cover to completely seal off this rear area and make it an actual trunk. Then you can't access it from the front, you can't see it from the windows, etc. When you put it down, then whatever you have back here, you can reach from the front if you absolutely had to. But either way, it kind of gives you a cargo area or trunk option in case you're carrying something extra secret in the trunk. Another interesting item back here, this car doesn't have a glove box. I'll get to interior storage in a minute, but it doesn't have a glove box, so the owner's manual is back here in the cargo area, in this little Velcro strap area. The owner's manual is this like bound book, bound in this nice cloth. It's a very high class owner's manual. In this area, you will also find a key box, which is a beautiful box wrapped in cloth that the dealership uses to present you with your key when you purchase a new Aston Martin. And this area back here also includes a tire repair kit with an air compressor compressor, etc. The cargo area of this car isn't large enough to fit a full-size spare tire underneath the floor, so instead you get this tire repair kit in case you want to attempt to fix your flat tire by yourself on the side of the road in your $185,000 Aston Martin. Now, there's one more interesting item around back, and that would be these things, these little plastic pieces that come out from the back surrounding the license plate. Originally, I thought it was the license plate lights, but it isn't. Instead, it's U.S. government federally mandated safety bumperettes. You may remember I reviewed the Bugatti Chiron, and it had these horrendously ugly bumperette things in back. Well, this is the same story. It's the same basic idea, although Aston Martin integrated it a little bit better. Nonetheless, if you get one of these, I bet you can take these right off off and no one will ever know or care. Next up, another interesting quirk, this one on the fuel filler cap door. You open it up and you can see that it tells you what octane to use in three different languages. Now, this isn't all that unusual in itself. The unusual part is which three languages they've chosen. You have English, Arabic, and Chinese. No French, no German. This kind of gives you an idea of Aston Martin's three largest markets just by looking inside the fuel filler. Now, next up, another cool feature of this car is these magic door hinges. This is something previous Aston Martin models have had as well, but it's still worth covering. Now, in your car, when you open the door, you can only open it to one of sort of three set places with the hinges. But with this car, when you open the door, you can kind of set the door wherever you want and it will stay put precisely where you open it. This even works on inclines, and it's a really cool feature because it allows you to get out of tight spaces and open the door just how much you want without worrying about it closing on you or something else. Now, another cool item in this car, just like in prior Aston Martin models, the doors open upwards just a little bit. I've heard two theories of why this is. One is, so if you park next to a high curb, you can clear the curb and you open the door. You don't have to worry about the door smacking into it. The other is so that when both doors are open, the car looks like it's spreading its wings, just like in the Aston Martin logo. Both of those theories seem plausible, and frankly, I love that the doors do that. And of course, one more item we must cover before moving inside. That would be the exhaust note, which sounds glorious. Take a listen. Next up, moving on to the interior of the Vantage, where there are quite a few interesting quirks and features, as one might expect. I'm going to start just with the door handles, which are very unusual. If you take a look at them, you'll notice they're pointing the wrong way. If you're sitting in the driver's seat, you can't really open the door with your left hand without kind of contorting it in a weird direction. It's easier to reach across with your right hand and open the door. It's very odd. Now, I was told the reason they did this is so that when you reach across with your right hand, you can simultaneously sort of look behind you and see if there's like traffic or a bicyclist coming. I'm not really sure if that's true, but it's a very strange door handle placement. Now, next up, moving further into the Vantage and onto the sun visors. Now, the sun visors cannot be detached and moved over to the left side to shield you from sun coming in on the side of the car, but they do have one very nice feature. The mirrors don't just open with a typical plastic lid. Instead, there's a little finger hole where you place your finger on some leather and then just slide it across to reveal the mirror. That is a finer way to have a visor mirror opener. Now, next up, one thing you notice when you climb in this car that you just can't not notice, 
especially if you're used to driving a Mercedes-Benz, is just how much Mercedes-Benz pieces are in this interior. Now, it's not as many as I thought there would be, but there's still a lot of stuff that is clearly for a Mercedes-Benz. The turn signal lever, the lever to adjust the height of the steering wheel, the cruise control lever, those are all straight out of Mercedes-Benz models. Also, you will notice that the controller for the infotainment system in the center console is straight out of the Mercedes-Benz models. It's exactly the same one you see in the S-Class, the E-Class, whatever. And that's because the infotainment system is straight out of Mercedes-Benz. Apparently, Aston Martin's deal with Mercedes-Benz is that Aston Martin gets the last generation Mercedes-Benz infotainment system for their cars. So whatever Mercedes-Benz is using for infotainment, Aston Martin has the prior Mercedes-Benz infotainment system. And that is, in fact, the exact situation here. Indeed, the infotainment system is straight out of a Mercedes-Benz from like three or four years ago. And it operates exactly the same way, although they changed some fonts and there are pictures of Aston Martins and Aston Martin logos instead of Mercedes-Benz logos, but it is exactly the same as basically the system that I have in my 2012 E63. It's kind of crazy to see that. And it isn't just all that stuff. The key is also very Mercedes-Benz-y because it's turning on a Mercedes-Benz powertrain. If you take off the backing of the key and expose the battery and then sort of undo the top part, you can see that the key looks just like my Mercedes-Benz key. And that's because it's just a Mercedes-Benz powertrain. Now, well, one interesting item with the key, if the engine start stop button fails to turn on the engine in this car, if the battery is dead or for some reason that button's just not working, you can always do that process of pulling off the back of the key, pulling it out and stick it in the center console where there is a manual car starter that isn't a button so that you can turn on the engine in your Aston Martin a second way if you want to. By the way, the key you see here is the valet key. It's nice enough, but this is the real key and it's a whole lot more attractive, correspondent to the beauty of the car. Now, next up, moving back to the center console, I wanna point out that this car has a lot of buttons. This is good for people who don't like touch screens and that screens are taking over, but there are a lot of buttons in here. There are buttons to turn on the dome lights. There's a button for lock and a separate button for unlock. The whole center console is filled with buttons. Now, the good news is there are no blank buttons, so nothing looks like you've spent a lot, but not quite spent enough, but still there are a lot of buttons. Now, the buttons that are most obvious and center in the whole center console are the buttons for the transmission selector. It's sort of a pyramid of buttons. You have park and reverse on one side, neutral and drive on the other, and they all point to the center where you have the start stop button, which has the Aston Martin logo on it, looking very regal in the middle of the button filled center control stack. Another interesting button related item on this car relates to the seat controls, which are right in the center tunnel. Now, you can see that the seat controls are there and they have memory controls. And for some reason, there's an Aston Martin logo in the seat controls. Doesn't seem to make any sense, but that's because this car doesn't have the crazy 40 million way seats. It has some lesser seat. The cars with the more functions for their seat controls have a button where the Aston Martin logo is. But rather than make a blank switch that would look ugly, Aston was like, no way, we're not gonna do that. And they put a separate plate on here with the Aston Martin logo so you would never know that the owner of this car cheaped out and didn't get the best seats possible. That is how you do blank switches, automakers, not having some switch in the middle that clearly looks like you just skipped out on some option. That is pretty good attention to detail. And speaking of attention to detail, in that same area, you can see that this whole center tub is carbon fiber, except there's this one little piece on the side it's leather and it's stitched. That's for your knee. And the theory there is that way you don't scuff up the carbon fiber with your knee. Your knee doesn't hit the carbon fiber, which doesn't feel so good. Instead, you can rest your knee on nice leather while you're driving down the road. That too is good attention to detail. Now, next up, moving on to interior storage. I mentioned before this car has no glove box, but everything else is fairly normal. It has little door pockets that are not fairly large. It has a center console you can put stuff in. And it has this little shelf behind the seats where you can stick whatever you want. Now, you also have access to the cargo area in here. I mentioned the divider before can turn the rear area into a trunk, but the front cargo area towards the seats is always available to you. So you can always reach in there and put stuff in there if it doesn't fit in the front seat. So with the cargo divider in place, there's kind of two cargo areas and that's a pretty good idea. Now, one rather unusual item is in the passenger side on the footwell, you can see that the passenger floor mat says VIN. It's kind of subtle, but it's there. You pull up the passenger floor mat and you can see that in the carpet, there's another little area that says VIN. I imagine if you pull that up, you would see the car's VIN. It's kind of unusual to see something like the carpet in a finely crafted Aston Martin interrupted with something as regulatory as a VIN, but I guess for whatever reason they have to put it down there and the carpet alerts you to the fact that it's 
hiding underneath. Now next up we move on to the seat trim in this car which is absolutely beautiful. You can see it has these gorgeous red accents with red stitching and you can see it also has this perforated leather that sort of starts perforated and then fades into just regular full leather. Aston Martin has a name for this, they call this placed perforation because of course they do. You can find it on the seat bottoms, the seat backs, and on the headliner, which also has red accents and red stitching, and that headliner is a $2,300 option. Normally it's just black Alcantara, but if you want it to match the seats, you gotta pay 2,300 bucks. Now next I wanna move on to some of the technology in this car. I'm gonna start in the gauge cluster in the steering wheel. There's a little S button on the steering wheel and that is to change the drive mode. But here's the cool thing. This car defaults to sport mode. You can see in the gauge cluster, there's only three modes, sport, sport plus, and track, which I am thrilled about. I always think it's ridiculous. You pay $185,000 for a 500 horsepower snarling sports car and then there's a sport mode. Shouldn't the whole car be a sport mode? Why is there a normal mode in a car like that? Well, this is a true sports car, according to Aston Martin, and so it defaults to sport mode. That's kind of cool. Now, one unusual item in that gauge cluster, it's all Mercedes-Benz software in there, and if you scroll through some screens, you can see that they say, press OK, press the OK button to do some function. But if you look on the Aston Martin steering wheel, you'll see there is no OK button. You just have to press down on the wheel that you're scrolling with. Now, obviously, Mercedes-Benz models that originally used this software had an OK button, and so they just left the software the same for Mercedes-Benz models, even even though this car doesn't actually have the OK button that corresponds to the prompts on the screen, which is kind of an interesting and humorous oversight. Now, next up, we move on to the infotainment system. There are a couple of interesting items. One is the fact that this car finally has a 360-degree camera. The DB11 has one, too. Aston Martin has finally reached the modern age. This car also has a junction view camera. So if you're pulling up to a junction you can't quite see out, you can turn on the junction view, and it looks to both sides. That is a good idea, especially in a car with a long front hood and sort of a front mid-engine design where the engine is behind the front axle, so there's a lot of car in front of you. It might be hard to see on some tight intersection. With that said, the cameras clearly aren't perfect. Have a look here. I'm parked next to some traffic cones, right? Now check the camera and the cones look like massive poles. This is hilarious and it's not unique to this car. 360 degree cameras always seem to have trouble with objects that are right near the vehicle itself. Now other interesting items in this infotainment system, there really aren't any. Like I said, this is the last generation Mercedes-Benz infotainment system and I've reviewed it in like a dozen cars. Nonetheless, I found a couple of unusual items. One is in the navigation settings. When you go into toll roads, you can choose whether you're going to use cash lanes or whether you have a toll pass. I imagine that way when it calculates the time to your destination, it knows to maybe add a couple more minutes if you have to use a cash lane and there's a line. That is an interesting configurable item. Another interesting configurable item in the navigation system is the amount of time that coordinates come into play. When you click on text info on map, you can choose between having the street name that you're currently driving on displayed, which is what everyone would want, or having your current coordinates displayed which is what no one ever would want. I have no idea why that's even an option, but they do a lot of stuff with coordinates in this infotainment system. For example, if you click on where am I, it shows you what direction you're pointing and it shows you your exact current coordinates which I can't imagine are particularly useful. The Where Am I screen also shows a little image of a satellite, and it shows you how many satellites are currently triangulating the position of your car, which I, I guess, you know, they can calculate that, but I don't know why any consumer driving the vehicle would ever have to know that. Nonetheless, it's on there. And so that's a tour of the new Vantage, and now it's time to get behind the wheel and see how it performs on the road. All right, driving the Vantage. First impression, this car feels a lot more like a sports car than a lot of the other Aston Martins that I've driven. Um, it's similar to the V12 Vantage in that respect, but the VB11 definitely feel, felt more like a uh, sort of relaxed cruiser in comparison. Obviously, DB11 is still very fast, but you can tell just sitting here, the steering wheel's kind of squared off as opposed to round. Everything's just like a little bit more striking. It's definitely not intended to be a relaxed car. Woo <laughs> wow, that sounds good. The engine actually definitely sounds better than it did in the uh, AMG GTS. The AMG GTS has a great sound to it as well. In this car, though, it feels deeper and sort of more angry. And the AMG GTS kind of more feels like, sounds like a little bit more like a race car, a little bit more peaky. I, I could see an argument either way. I'm really, the acceleration is just fantastic. 
The thing that I really like about this car is it's the kind of car that I like. I, I don't necessarily love cars that are two, three, four hundred thousand dollars and have a seven hundred horsepower V12 and blah. You don't need any of that stuff. And I get that it's cool, but you can't even really use any of that stuff. This car is a lot more usable. Sitting in a stomp plate, you look around the interior, it looks really nice. You got all the typical, you know, luxury items. Uh, there are a lot of buttons in the middle. Um, everybody else has gone to, you know, a lot of screens and kind of removed buttons from the equation in large part. Aston Martin still has physical buttons. My viewers often complain about cars that have screens. They say that, no, I don't want a touch screen, I want physical buttons. Well, here you go. Driving along now, I'm on a kind of a curvy, an empty, curvy, wide road. It's the perfect road for this. The car is just excellent. It really feels like a sports car. Man, I love those exhaust pops. It really feels like a sports car. It feels very flat. Punching out of a corner is just so rewarding. Man, this thing just feels great. It feels super flat. It, and the AMG GTS is one of my favorite new cars. This thing feels just as good, if not better. It has a better exhaust sound, and obviously it has the look. Um, this is really an impressive car. Uh, it really, really feels it in the corners. And the steering does not feel numb. Like in a lot of modern cars, you're a little bit disappointed in that. Obviously, it's a little lighter than old school anything. But it doesn't feel numb. It feels direct. It feels precise. The car stays reasonably flat. And you downshift. It's fairly instantaneous, very smooth, and it just sounds so good. This is a wonderful car. When you think Aston Martin, you don't necessarily think sports car, but this is that. This car is angry and sporty and fast and fun, and it isn't going to be only sold based on its look. So it's a beautiful car. Well, it is a nice looking car, but unlike previous Astons, that isn't the only cool thing about it. It's also a lot of fun. And so that's the 2019 Aston Martin Vantage. It isn't as classically beautiful as its predecessor, but it's striking, strikingly cool, strikingly fun and fast, striking to look at. This is the new era of Aston Martin, where it's not all about design, where performance and beauty work together for the best possible experience. And it's a pretty good experience. And now it's time to see how it stacks up against the competition with a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Vantage is handsome, though not quite as beautiful as prior Vantage models, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, which just slides it into a 9 out of 10. Handling is strong and sharp, it really does feel like a sports car, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Fun factor is high, it's exciting to drive in almost any capacity, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is a bit lower, as the Vantage is the entry-level Aston, and so it'll become somewhat common, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 39 out of 50. As for the daily category, starting with features, the Vantage is fine, but it uses some older tech and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is acceptable, it's not incredibly soft, but not crazy harsh either, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is good, the interior is very nice with a few drawbacks, but long-term reliability is a concern, especially when you mesh a British luxury brand and AMG, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is mediocre, two seats are a demerit, but a big cargo area helps give it a 3 out of 10. Value is decent. Yes, this uses the same powertrain as the AMG GTS and it costs more money, but it's not much more. The base price of the Aston is about 15 grand higher than the GTS, or roughly 10%, which to me is a decent deal for the much stronger Aston brand name. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 28 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 67 out of 100, and here's where it stacks up against the closest rivals. It ties the AMG GTS. The Vantage is more expensive, but the Vantage is also more exciting. It loses to the AMG GTR and the R8 V10, both of which are simply more exciting, but also more expensive. 